Hi, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this uh, session uh, powered by Sinoco, uh, a masterclass, a very fun masterclass, if I may add, because I'm looking forward to this one. Um, we'll be tasting sherry uh, later on tonight, six different cherries, and we'll be hearing all about the Tio Pepe challenge and some uh, cocktail inspiration. Um, the next session uh, that's organized by Sinoco will be on the 21st of March, which will be a Heaven Hill Masterclass. So uh, look out for that one, which will be really interesting and cool too. Um, just uh, practical things. If you have any questions, just put them in the chat. I'll, uh, I'll, um, uh, sorry, if uh, I, I was just watching the chat because somebody was talking to me. So I'll, I'll be watching the chat and passing on all questions that you have. Um, but the main speaker of tonight, uh, you already see him, of course, is uh, Gonzalez Bias, international brand ambassador, uh, bartender, um, and also somebody who's been all over the world, uh, very uh, international man, uh, Mr. Joao Vicente, welcome. Thank you very much, Jerome, for the invitation, and uh, thanks everybody for the, taking the time and joining us today. Um, I'm very pleased to be here well, although we are not face to face, I hope this is one of the last uh, gatherings that we have that has to be you know, in front of a laptop and next time we'll be face to face and then we can hear our glasses, you know, uh, touching each other. Uh, but yeah, but we have a mission today and our mission today is of course uh, to taste uh, these beautiful sherries, but also to recruit bartenders for our competition. Mm -hmm. So before we go into that, I would like to start this session with, with a question. Yeah? A question that, of course, is directed to the bartenders. Um, and it's very simple. Do you remember the first time that you got inside of a bar and you create a cocktail for someone? If you do remember this experience, this moment, please just use the chat and just give me a thumbs up. This moment where you create a cocktail and you gave it to someone and you got a smile back or maybe a nice tip. The moment you really uh, knew that you were made for cocktail making. That's, that's exactly. the moment you're looking for. Yeah. I know what there's a lot, of, a lot of bartenders who were joining, but they will watch the recording afterwards. But there's Jordan, there's already a thumbs up. So, uh, so Jordan, this summer in or? I mean, all time, all time. So the first, the very first time. I guess some people maybe need a glass of sherry first to revive their memories. I think so, yeah. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Yeah. For some people, it might be a very long time because I actually learned my daughter to make cocktails uh, last year, and she's only eight, she's only nine years old now. So uh, yeah, but she exactly. does mocktails for me, so that's that's quite good. Okay, somebody uh, answered this summer in the summer pop up bar in our garage. Yeah. So see, it's not long ago. Um, mine is a little bit uh, earlier than that. So that's about 21 years and about two months. I know that exactly because it's, it's a very easy date to remember. It was the night, the New Year's Eve from 2000 to 2001. So this is Joao with 17 years old, getting a gig uh, in, the, in a bar. And uh, just to situate yourself, this is uh, in Edis Saira, uh, my hometown, a uh, town very close to the ocean. And the bar is just about 15 meters. From the from the beach mm -hmm. so in there i got a gig on uh, on a bar that i had to make three cocktails so i don't know which one i did first but they were very simple the three of them one is capirinha capiroska and murangoska and of course you don't know what a murangoska is because that's in portuguese murango <laughs> means strawberry so it's basically a strawberry capiroska a very simple recipe um but of course you know in a uh, in this in this area, it's very popular uh, as we have good strawberries and it's very easy to do. Three ingredients, strawberries, sugar, vodka. Yeah, right. so very simple, crushed ice, churn it, and you have a beautiful, beautiful cocktail, tasty, looks good. Uh, and, and so it's, it's an amazing experience. So I got on this afternoon a crash course on how to make this simple cocktail cutting 25 kilos of strawberries, first of all, <laughs> uh, and maybe the same amount of limes. 
But the thing is, the first moment that I gave this cocktail, I did my best, you know, to make it beautiful and, you know, the right proportions. The first moment that I gave to someone, they gave me feedback. They gave me a smile. They said, oh, that's amazing. I'm not sure if they were being just nice because they saw that I was my first day. But this was very rewarding. Giving experience to this person was just fantastic. And of course, that kept with me for a long time till I decided to give up on being a sports teacher to embrace a bartender's career. Now, the problem is try to explain this to my parents. <laughs> <laughs> of course, they wanted me to be a, I don't know, a banker or a doctor. Although being a bartender, you can make both. You are mm-hmm. dealing with money, so you are kind of a banker. And you're also taking care of the illnesses of your guests, right? So they come yes. with a bad mood and you're going to, you know, fix that somehow. Mm-hmm. So the thing is, they were not happy. But something changed when I start to try to get more professional, trying to get more knowledge, right? Uh, getting to master classes like this one or uh, going to courses in London, for example, you know, getting more knowledge together with, with someone that was already more experienced. And this slowly, slowly made my, my parents look at this career as valid, okay? Mm-hmm. So now what I'm saying to you is that there is three things that I think that a bartender should have is professionalism. And that comes from you know, the knowledge that you gather, uh, the curiosity that is always there. Then creativity, you need to be creative, of course, in this job and hospitality, mm-hmm. right? This is, well, it's a no brainer. But it is what it is. It is three things. None of them are on top of each other. It's kind of a circle, but the three are very important. Now, what I want to say with this is that we are inviting you to a competition that wants to reward these three things. Professionalism, of course, creativity. It's a cocktail competition and hospitality. Yeah? Mm-hmm. We, f- we share the same feeling as you when you receive the guests in your bar. We share it as well when we receive the guests in Jerez La Frontera. Okay, so we have a lot in common. All right. So uh, I would say now that we just move on to the, the presentation because we have beautiful, beautiful wines to taste and also a few guidelines on how to take part in this competition. Yeah, you can all see the presentation now. Yes, I see nodding. That's perfect. So let's Very go good. on to this this first slide, which is basically a lot of uh, practical information about the Tio Pepe challenge. Exactly. So we have uh, we are inviting bartenders to create cocktails with uh, with, with sherry. Um, the first step is, of course, to head over the website uh, that is not here, but you're going to be somewhere uh, in another slide. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, tiopepe.com/challenge. Yep. In there, you're going to find uh, additional theory package uh, that you can study uh, because you're going to have to fill a test. So today we're going to go a little bit on a shortcut. We're going to be focusing on the wines, the characteristics, characteristics of this wine, and also the capability of this wine to uh, in cocktails and also with food. But in there, you're going to have details about production, about the history uh, of Jerez. Okay, mm-hmm. that's the first step. And of course, this is uh, into this First category, getting the knowledge, right? Um, We have eight tickets uh, reserved for cocktail recipes. So eight finalists will be selected by the cocktail recipes that you're going to be sending in. From Belgium, Joel, from Belgium. Eight eight finalists from Belgium, yes. Exactly, exactly. So you just have to send in your recipe, of course, with a nice photo description, uh, and of course, also your data. Uh, and then you're going to be ready for the selection that we're going to do uh, on the 20, uh, 25th of 25th March. Of March. Okay? Now, I say that there is 10 tickets, and I just said there is eight coming from the recipes. And that's correct, because we have another challenge that will award two wild cards. Mm-hmm. It's a very simple challenge and actually quite fun, because you're going to be using one of those. This is a, a I'll stop, I'll stop the, the presentation. so. People can see it better. There's the Venetia. Can you see it? Yeah. There's this long stick with a cup, right? And a hook as well. 
right? It's this beautiful instrument that, of course, is an icon of the sherry culture. This is what the venenciadores, and of course, a, tool, a very important tool for the winemakers, uh, is, is, is this the tool that they use to get on inside of the barrel and extracting the wine, right? Um, actually, I can already exemplify how this works, mm -hmm. okay? So I will have to make here a small trick, which is take out my background. I think also this is one of the most beautiful Spanish words I've ever heard, venenciadores. Venenciadores. It's, it sounds great. So. I must admit I'm better with the Venencia, but not so good with technology. So this might take one more second or two. Yeah, that's good. But I think now it's good. So now you can see me, right? Yes. Okay. I have to make it quite high. So what you're going to need, it's a wine glass. Yes. Later on, I'm going to explain why a wine glass and not a copita, which is the classic one, but also this is going to make your life easier, yeah. right? So you're just going to need a little bit of liquid inside. Now, the main reason why we do that is because sherry wines are wines that are asleep. They age for many, many years. Uh, in the example of Fino, it's about four and a half years. So we need to find a way to awake this wine. And one of the ways is by uh, aerating the wine. And this is very similar to one of the techniques that we use uh, in the bar as well, which is the throwing technique. So it works kind of the same, okay? So you just have to get uh, your cup higher and then just go down with the glass, okay? This will need some practicing, Joao. <laughs> and there you go. And then you just have to cut it in the end and here you have your wine, okay? So now on this Instagram Reels, we don't gonna be focusing so much on the technique, but more on the fun side uh, of using the Venencia and also the features of the Instagram Reels. So, so the, idea, the idea is that, that who, the, the, the people that want to participate for this wildcard, they make an Instagram Reel and they share it through the same, uh, uh, um, channels and then you can judge the, the video actually. So it's more than just doing it perfectly, it's making a show about it. Exactly. So exactly, it's, it's more on the fun part on the creativity and the originality of the Instagram reel. So you can be using, I don't know, uh, once again, who uses uh, Instagram and who makes reels with it, at least recently? Mm. Just put it in the chat if you have. Because, uh... Yeah. So we're going to be um, of course, you're going to be posting this in your own profile under an hashtag, which is hashtag two pepper wildcard uh, BL, right? Mm -hmm. Or BE, sorry. Uh, and then we're going to be tracking these, uh, these reels and, of course, selecting the two most uh, creative and original. If you have any questions about all of this, you can actually, you know, uh, in the end of the session, make all the questions uh, when we are done with, with the tasting as well. Yeah, we'll, go, we'll just go through the tasting first and then we can, we can have questions afterwards, of course. Yeah. So, uh, so, maybe it's, uh, it's fun, uh, Joao, to show some images from the last couple of years of the Tio Pepe Challenge to... Yes, uh, please. To, uh, so people have an idea what this will be about and how much fun it is, actually. So. Exactly. So last year, we could, we could not um, uh, host the, the competition in, in its classic format. So we had to, to come up with another way to still interact with bartenders all over the world uh, and you know, showcase what this uh, category can do uh, in the mixology. So we created a competition called Tio Pepe One-on-One, -on -one, which was an uh, online battle. And uh, well, we had uh, an amazing participation of Matthias Sobenon. Of course, he is not only a master of cocktails, but uh, he's also a master of Instagram, uh, as you know, and he did a fantastic job. Uh, so just to have an idea, there was uh, different eliminatories, always one against one, and they had to create a cocktail based on a thematic, okay? Uh, it went actually pretty far, so to the semifinals, uh, and it was just a lot of fun because 
was not just about the cocktail, but there was also some quizzes and some uh, ice carving uh, challenges. Actually, actually, last year at about the time of the challenge, Matthias did a couple of masterclasses like this uh, together with Bram, actually. Uh, and we actually got uh, got some good support for him up uh, also through the masterclasses uh, because people had to vote for uh, for the participants to go through. So uh, Exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. And uh, also, um, Matthias is one of the judges now, if I uh, understood correctly. Exactly. So he's, one of, he's going to be helping us out uh, in the judge panel of, of the national final. So it's going to be uh, myself, Matthias, and uh, Stefan Born. Uh, so Stefan from Sinoco, yeah. From Sinoco, exactly. And yeah. the finals will be in the headquarters of uh, Sinoco, uh, which we can see if you see Glenn uh, in, the, in his background, you can see the headquarters in, uh, in Nivelle. So that's where the finals will be held uh, this year on the 11th of April. Correct. Just get that info through. Uh, yes, but Two Pepper 101 was last year and we want to go back. We want to go back to 2019. So in 2019, we could host the natural formats of this competition. Uh, so here we have beautiful images of, uh, of the Belgian final. Uh, this beautiful event. And we had Yente Gis uh, coming Yente. with us to Jerez La Frontera. Uh, let me just talk a little bit what the, the final itself uh, mm -hmm. consists in. So we have three challenges. One of them is uh, the blind tasting. So that's why it's so important later on, you know, to talk a little bit about the wines uh, and being able to identify them. And then you have the Venezia, once again. But in here, you're going to need a little bit more of practice. No cuts. <laughs> there, there was already a question uh, in the chat, but it was personally to me. So I'm not going to disclose who wants to remain anonymous. But the question is, uh, do we have to use wines to practice or do, uh, can we also use water? <laughs> you are allowed to use, of course, of course, water. Yes, yes. You can for the, drink for the sherry. Practicing. Yeah. You can drink the sherry, but pour the water. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. Somebody it's is very reassured now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an easy technique. You're going to need a few tries. So better to try a little bit with water, and then you're going to get more and more comfortable. Uh, and at one point, you are not wasting any, any liquid. Then you are ready to, to go and pour some tube pepper. Yeah. Okay. All right. So in there, as I said, it's going to be, we're going to be judging the technical part. So the amount in the glass, and of course, the style that you implement. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I said, uh, this is a bit of practice, but don't worry because uh, we're going to be distributing a few of them, uh, not individually, but every venue we're going to get one. So if you have a team of three, for example, you can share. Sharing is caring, right? Um, and then you can, you know, get everybody ready uh, for the for the final. Last but not least, this is the cocktail competition. So then there, you will have to present your cocktail. Um, we will have to make a performance uh, in front of the judges. And the sum up of all these tr three challenges will be uh, the total score that, of course, is, gonna, uh, is going to discover who will go with us to Jerez. Yeah. Because that is the so, prize, of course, uh, to go exactly. to Jerez with you. I mean, it is definitely a prize because the experience in Jerez is just uh, one in one lifetime. Uh, you're going to be going with us to visit the bodega, the vineyards. And of course, this is all in the same week where we're celebrating um, La Feria del Caballo, which is uh, just a festival where we celebrate all around the Andalusia culture. Horses, flamenco and sherry. For the entire week, places are closing. Uh, it's very, very hard to find one one open um, shop because everybody's going to be celebrating in La Feria. So you're going to be enjoying that uh, for about four days. And of course, competing in the international final, fighting for the title. Um, and this year, we are very happy to announce that we're going to be supported by Mr. Giorgio Bargiani, uh, the head mixologist of the Conot uh, Bar. Uh, in Which is London. like the, the top of the top. Exactly. Uh, I guess this year there is no uh, no one above them. Uh? Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's just a great personality that's going to uh, help us uh, a lot. Uh, you know, so he's the one to impress uh, if you are the lucky one to come with us. 
Now, this is already a lot of motivation, but uh, just let me mention that there's going to be a 5,000 euro prize money to be shared for the first five places. So a little bit of cash you know, in the end of the day is also good. Uh, so you're also going to have a good chance uh, of getting that one. Okay. okay. Cool. Uh, we'll be sharing the, the all the links you need to participate. We'll put them in the chat and send them to you afterwards in mail. So you'll have everything uh, if you didn't uh, write it down with your pencils now. So you'll have that in your mailbox. So don't worry about that if you missed that. So uh, I think um, we should go on to the to the tasting part, to the to the wine part. And then uh, afterwards, if there's any more questions, just ask them all uh, at the end of the session. All right. Okay, so just right before we start to taste uh, the sherries, uh, let me just say that Gonzalez Bias uh, is, uh, is a wine family, is a wine producer. So we have not just sherry wines, but we also uh, own uh, quite, quite a few uh, wineries, uh, not just in Spain. So in Spain, we have about 10 uh, and also uh, in, in the New World, so in Chile and Mexico. And also, uh, not recently, because we are already uh, brandy producers uh, since long ago, but we also um, own London Number no. One, Mom Gin, and Nomad Whiskey. Okay, mm -hmm. um, so it's not just sherry; it is actually a very vast portfolio. So, which is which is also very good to remember if you're creating your cocktails for the challenge. Think about all the other wines and spirits that uh, is in the same family, because that will certainly help. Exactly. Yeah, that's a, that's the best tip that we can give. Okay. Good. So we are ready to to start to taste our wines. Okay. And well, <laughs> the thing is, when we when we say that we're going to taste sherry, the question is which one, right? Because this slide just shows you the diversity of the sherry world uh, from. Uh, three types of grapes that we have in Jerez, uh, we can make so many styles. We can we, we can go on so many roads. Uh, so we, as you can see here, we can do uh, Palomino Fino. We can go on Oloroso, Palo Cortado, Amontillados. Uh, we can go to the cream sherries. So as you see, it's very diverse, mm -hmm. uh, diverse, diverse world. That depending on the way that you do uh, or the method that you do the wine, how you fortify it, how you age it. So it's very rich in that sense. Okay. So we're going to start obviously for the beginning, which is our Fino sherry, right? Uh, our Tio Pepe, right? It's, uh, it's the umbrella brand of Gonzalez Bias. It's a Fino sherry. What that means? It means it is made of 100% Palomino. In Jerez, we have three types of grape Palomino. Muscatel and Pedro Jimenez, uh, being the Palomino uh, or accounting the Palomino for 90% of the production. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so it's definitely the, the, the grape that is most produced in the area. And this is a wine that, if you put it in your glass, and by the way, it should be a wine glass. It is a wine, as I said uh, before, it's aging for a long time. And here we have four years actually four years and a half of aging. And if you look at your glass, it's more than four years old. You should it's hold older. it in front of yourself, uh, Joao, or we can't see it. Yeah, that's yeah, that's better. Yeah. I mean, you all have a glass in front of you. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, it's uh, 8.30, so you have no sun. Actually, when it's afternoon, you know, if you have the sun through the window, it's actually quite nice to, to look into it. Mm -hmm. Because we used to say that Tio Pepe is the... Son of Jerez in a bottle, right? And it's due to his color, this uh, golden bright color. And what the most amazing is that it's a four years old, right? But the color is still very bright. Normally it would oxidate. And the reason why it doesn't oxidate is because uh, there is a, a layer of yeast forming on the top of the wine. So it's nature actually helping us, you know, to produce this wine. I'll, so, show, I'll just show the layer. Yes. There you go. Exactly. So when you fortify, so uh, let's let's keep in mind that we have, when we do the fermentation, we have a wine that is 11 to 12%. Mm -hmm. 
but then we're going to fortify this wine, right? And we're just going to fortify it to 15, 15.2%. In these thresholds, uh, the yeast can form on top of the wine, and in a matter of days, it's going to cover completely, making a shield uh, to the wine from the oxygen, right? So this wine was shielded. There was no contact with the oxygen. That's why, you know, it's still this bright color. Now, people, people are asking, uh, should we enjoy this room temperature or chilled? Chilled. It's uh, very important. Actually, five to six degrees, if you drink it pure, it is very important that it has five to six degrees. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Treat it as uh, you would treat, um, well, a white wine also could be the same kind of uh, temperature. Um, I would treat it like a, like a good cava or like a good champagne. Yeah, so it has to be chilled to be better enjoyed. Yeah. Okay. Even if you are in the not so hot country, of course, <laughs> if you are in Jerez, you're going to have uh, 28, uh, 29 degrees. But mm-hmm. even if you are in Belgium, it is better enjoyed if it's the right temperature. Okay. okay. Now, another example uh, of the presence or another indicator of the presence of the yeast on the top of this wine is when you go to the nose. So when you go to the nose, you're gonna have this bakery, this tertiary kind of aromas. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know, did you ever bake bread? Like some so, bread, yeah. Yeah, so before you actually bake it, uh, you're gonna have this yeasty uh, mm-hmm. kind of aromas. Yeah, so that's the same thing over here. It's like going to a bakery in the morning uh, when they are still, you know, baking their first bread. That's going to be the, the same thing. Yeah. Uh, Helen so, is asking, should all sherry be chilled or just the phenol? Yes. All of the sherry should be chilled. Okay. Yes. In different temperatures. We can cover a little bit that, but in different temperatures. Yes. They have different nuances. Uh, so you need to, yeah, you, you need to know which temperature to, to be better enjoyed. Yes. Now, of course, when you go to the nose, and I think that you already tasted some of you, but when you go to the nose, uh, you, you're gonna already feel that it is a dry wine, right? Uh, and that's because the, the wine was having the yeast on top and the yeast has actually a living organism. So it has to feed on something. So the yeast is consuming all the sugar, glycerin, dissolved oxygen. So it's just feeding on all these nutrients. And of course, the wine after four years have very little of those, okay? So that's why it smells already dry, right? And on the mouth, I mean, it's, it's bone dry, it's razor sharp, yeah? We're talking about a wine with very less, very uh, little sugar and also no glycerin. And glycerin is uh, kind of a sugar that is giving us the sweet sensation and here is not present at all. Mm-hmm. Now, the good thing is that the lack of that is making this wine an excellent aperitif. It's a wine that you want to go for it one more time, right? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's also serving as a flavor enhancer, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's why it's so good with food. This is a very gastronomical wine. It is, of course, fantastic with the food that we serve in Jerez. Tapas, for example, mm-hmm. there you go ham. Uh, Fish, probably. Well, fish, I mean, sushi, if you are a sushi lover, oh. this is a great pairing. I mean, it's also different from tasting the wine alone and tasting the wine with food because they complement each other, okay? And, and, and if you talk like this about a wine that goes so well with food, I mean, all the wines go well with food, right? Pairing. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but in here, we can also see that this flavor enhancing capacity is also very good in mixology, right? Mm-hmm. With liquid ingredients. Yeah. So actually, I, I like to say that, uh, for example, Fino Sherry is not just a cocktail ingredient, it's a cocktail tool. As okay. you can use it in so many different kinds of cocktails uh, in so many different ways. So you can use it as, uh, for example, a, as a flavor enhancer, for example, in the in in infusion, right? Mm-hmm. Trying to extract flavors from other ingredients, it works just fantastic. I mean, 
of course, when you do that, normally you look for spirits that have a lot of alcohol that you can, mm -hmm. uh, you know, extract that faster. But this wine is capable of doing the same, even with just 15%, which is actually amazing. It's perhaps not the, the, the ingredient in the spotlight, but it's a good friend of the other ingredients, link them together, combining them together. Yeah. All right. I'm I trying to... I'm trying to share uh, one of the an example of a cocktail uh, on the screen, but my mouse is actually doing something strange. So uh, just give me a second <laughs> uh, to give the people some inspiration. Yes. I don't know why. Ah, there we go. That should work. I don't know what's happening. My mouse is doing something. Ah, there we are. I see here a question. So how long can you enjoy? an open bottle of Pinot. Okay, so there is a few things in consideration here. Uh, it is a wine, so it's, it's, it's kind of delicate, right? So if you open a normal bottle of wine, how many days would you keep it uh, you know, in your fridge? Uh, but because this is a wine that has a little bit of fortification, it holds a little bit better. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't have this problem because a bottle of Pinot in my house, it's, very fast away. I'm going to explain why. Because we drink it and we cook with it all the time. Uh, so it, it's very fast. Uh, either we do uh, some sherry tonics. So in a matter of one day, it's done. Um, but it's a wine that's after one week, if you seal it well, and this is in, on the fridge, mm -hmm. uh, it's okay, one week, even two weeks, it's okay. It's not gonna be perhaps it's its best, but it's gonna be fine, okay? Yeah. All right. I'll, uh, I'll put that uh, Andalusian cadence on the, on the screen again. Uh, okay. So maybe you could talk us, talk us through this, uh, Joao. Exactly. So uh, this is uh, the proposal of uh, Matthias Soberan last year for the first round. So we ask uh, the participants to do a, a high ball with, with Fino. And uh, it's just an example of how easy it is, right? So we have uh, Fino, we have London number one to give it a little bit of more body to the cocktail, but not too much. Uh, so it, we can say it's a low ABV drink, so very trendy. And of course, it fits well with, the, with this new uh, wave of, of health that our guests are, are you know, demanding more and more. So a lot of people are going even for non-alcoholic cocktails. So I think it's, it's something that we have to pay attention to. Uh, and then, I mean, here, perhaps it's not as simple as, you know, just a sherry tonic, but uh, mm -hmm. you can give it easily a twist with some homemade uh, ingredient. And here's the case, a homemade grapefruit and rosemary cordial. So uh, I tried myself uh, following the guidelines of Matthias, super, super tasty, super fresh and then uh, fill it up with tonic. Yeah, so very simple, uh, but just, you know, uh, just really, really delicious. Yeah, and this is the explanation that Matthias uh, gave for-, uh, for Yes, well, this is, I put this slide over here, not, you know, to bother you, uh, bother you with a lot of text, but here's a good example of how uh, your cocktail description should look like. So a good detailed recipe, right? Uh, and that, that, you know, that everybody that could read this uh, could just follow the steps and do the cocktail as well. Uh, and then, of course, the inspiration behind. I think that's very important. You're going to be willing to captivate uh, the judges that are selecting your recipe. So put a little bit of more effort in that to upgrade your, your chances uh, to get to the final 10. Okay. Now, just going to give you another example. You have to pass one more. Um, Jerome? Nope. Yes. Yes. Um, and here is to show, once again, what I was saying is the versatility of uh, Tio Pepe. Of course, I mean, if you are a bartender for a, quite a while, you know there is a lot of classic cocktails with, uh, with Fino Sherry, which is the case, for example, of the Adonis. And you can twist that very easily as well, you know, uh, for a competition, for example, and to implement your own story. Um, so here we have a Fino Sherry with uh, vermouth, rum, 
and orange bitters. So a beautiful twist on uh, an Adonis. Um, and also show us that tea pepper can be used in a long drink as before, but also in a short drink, making this short drink that normally are, you know, a little bit more crafty and, and, and harder on alcohol, but a little bit more pleasant and a little bit more uh, aperitif style, let's say. It looks good too. Uh, and, and of course, uh, also another good example, uh, the same for Matthias, but you know, put a little bit of effort in your photo uh, because uh, the selection is going to be very visual as well. So the more effort you put in the description and your photo, the more chances you're going to have. Okay. Now, another interesting thing about Fino is that when this, the, the life of Tio Pepe ends, is actually not the end. Hmm. So what happens is that after four years and a half, we're going to bottle Tio Pepe, but some of the wine, some of these barrels will be reserved to continue the path through the bodega. Okay. So after that, another wine will be born. And this is going to be uh, our Amontillado, which is Vigna a Abbe. wine. Vigna Abbe, exactly. And that's exactly what we're going to taste uh, after. So it's just a continuation of the life of Tio Pepe. But now the yeast starts to die off after four and a half years because there is no more nutrients. So it starts to open uh, some holes and slowly, slowly, it will actually die off and go to the bottom of the barrel, okay? And even when the life of Adi Amontillado is over, it's not the end, because then we can age it further. And then we're going to have this beautiful 30-year-old uh, Del Duque, which is just a concentrated version of a tube pepper. Imagine 30 years in a barrel, right? Uh, in all these flavors being concentrated, the alcohol goes up, the nuttiness, the, the, the woods flavors, everything is in haste. So, and, and just, just to make it clear, because uh, it's every time you start a new Solera system for each aging that you do? Like... So, in fact, you're going to be surprised, but we don't use very often new barrels. Actually, it's always the same barrels, but the, we, we always making them um, uh, kind of a, a scale of the wine. So we mix the wine, so we bottle some, and then they're just going to move to the next soleras. But the barrels are never empty. So mm -hmm. you can use barrels for 50, 60, 70 years. In fact, if they are broken, <laughs> that's the reason why they are actually black. I don't know if you already saw it. Uh, it's just because it's easier to spot the leakage what we do is we just uh, substitute the staves. That's what we do. So we don't do a new barrel. Uh, we just use the same, but we substitute all, this, all, all the time the staves. Yeah. yeah. All right. So new soleras are very rare. Okay. I, I mean, uh, so you have a, a solera for the Amontillado, then you bottle yes. the Amontillado, and then everything that you need to, to grow into Del Duque goes into a different solera, or does it? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. So you have dedicated soleras, yes. And just one more thing. Um, we don't, so uh, we don't top the barrels on the top of each other. Well, yes, but not like different years. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, we have, you know, the, the barrel is, is marked with the, with the stage of the wine, and then we just move it accordingly. Otherwise, for example, you have Tio Pepe. I mean, you would have four years, but then Vigna Abbe has 12. So we cannot talk them on the top of each other. We just have different areas. Mm -hmm. We just move the wine accordingly. Okay. There's a question in the chat. One solera is always four layers, uh, Giovanni asks. Uh, or is that in, different? In the, in the bodega, yes, it is. Because uh, higher is going to be harder to handle, actually. Oh, yeah. And just also, can't reach. Is, yes, it's not reachable. And, um, uh, well, also the weight of it. We're talking about 600 liters capacity barrels that we fill to 500 liters. So that's, that's a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. Now here, the next picture is actually uh, from inside of the barrel, the same as, uh, as before, but now we are missing something. We are missing the layer of this. Mm -hmm. 
And this is happening uh, with wines that are fortified over this threshold that we were talking about before, the 60%. And with this kind of conditions, there is no formation of yeast. So the wine is oxidating from the first moment. Okay. Now, the next wine that we're going to taste is actually the Amontillado. And the Amontillado is enjoying the two types of aging. Mm -hmm. So part of his life under the yeast and part without the yeast. Okay. So, so the first four years is under the, the yeast, under the floor, and then, then it dies down and then it stays, uh, it keeps on aging for about 12 years, you said, I think. And then it yes. becomes the Amontillado that we're tasting now. Exactly. And of course, we can see that immediately. When we pour it into, into the glass, then you're going to see this dark golden color. Yeah. yeah so the wine changed completely. Oh, I have to move it over here. Mm -hmm. But everybody has, has the glass, so you can actually mm -hmm. enjoy uh, the color of it. Now, let's not forget, this is coming from Tio Pepe, right? But it's completely modified now. So when you smell it, of course, you're going to have some reminders of what mm -hmm. this wine was, but now it's changed forever. What, what you had in Tio Pepe was almonds, for example. Here, perhaps hazelnuts, right? It's going to be a bit more mature uh, nuts. You're going to have, of course, more wood. There's more time in the barrel. Everything that this oxidation is bringing, more nuttiness, more dry fruits. Mm -hmm. But still, you can, you, can, you can have this yeast, but it's not so intense anymore. It, it just tastes older in every way possible than the uh, yes than the Tio Pepe. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, there is also it's a very complex wine. There is a lot of wild herbs as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, what does, uh, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, no sure. Next no, question. I was just going to ask you, what does the name Amontillado actually refer to? Is that just the color or uh, or uh, Amontillado? It? Yeah. Well, this is a good question. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the name of, of the wine, but I'm not sure what is the, really the meaning of Amontillado. Um, hmm. I, I heard that it had that I something to make. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah, I heard <laughs> that it had something to do with almonds, that it was some kind of uh, Spanish version of almonds for the color of it, but uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not I don't know if I'm that was sure. True. I'm not sure. This is a question for, the, for Antonio Flores, for our winemaker. Never did it. Um, if you would have asked me why it's called Vigna AB. <laughs> okay, that was my <laughs> next question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually one of the first vineyards of Gonzalez Bias, and it's uh, and Andreas Bonanas. So it's the name of, of the man that sold this vineyard for Gonzalez Bias. Yes, it's one of the first vineyards of, uh, uh, bought by the family. Yeah. It is, of course, you know, located. Uh, uh, in one of the, the pagos that is center of, of Jerez. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, this is a wine that has more uh, age, more um, different flavors. I think also more character, I think. Uh, if, if, yes, uh, if, if, definitely. I mean, there is, there is a totally different personality in these wines. And, the, yeah. and of course, uh, here the, the food pairing uh, is, going to be, is going to be different already. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, you can have some aspargos, some artichokes, so it changes completely. Uh, yeah, possibly put it on the screen. So in, indeed, so it, it said there on the screen, uh, spicy food, asparagus, artichoke. Uh, yes. Th those are quite uh, powerful foods too. So it, uh, it is a wine yes. that can stand up to this, I think. So. Exactly. Also some, um, you know, some Asian, uh, Asian foods that is spicy. It's, it's a perfect, perfect match. Yeah. yeah? Does, now, does it also mean that, that you use this kind of wine differently in a cocktail? If you're mixing with it? Yes, definitely. Um, I mean, of course, there is some cocktails, uh, even if you have an Adonis, for example, or a bamboo, for example. By changing the wine, you, you're changing uh, a lot of the personality of this cocktail, but you can use it on the same cocktail, kind of, mm -hmm. but it's going to be totally different. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but I think that also pairs very well with uh, tropical food, uh, by, by instance. I mean, it's no different from Tio Pepe, but the result that you're going to get is going to be totally different. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Yeah, so this now, is one this is one uh, one example that we put in the in the presentation the heat of Jerez, which is also a great name, I think. So uh, yes, this was actually quite a nice concept from uh, from Andrian um, from uh, from Norway, um, mm -hmm. and he did kind of a concept with the with the uh, for the elements: fire, winds, water. So it was quite quite interesting. This was the fire one. Um, and yeah, and here he uses the, the Amontillado uh, for an infusion with sunflower feet, seeds, uh, and he paired it with uh, peach brandy. So here you can see already, you know, different ingredients being paired, a little bit of verjou and uh, turmeric, the flower, and of course a splash of uh, Villarnau. Yeah, and then he has here this spray of crusty bread perfume. I'm not really sure what's this, but... Uh, <laughs> But it looks good in the description, though. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I have no idea how you make that or what that is or what it smells like, but it's it looks good. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. It's in fact one of my favorite wines, and um, also one of the most limited wines, because, as we mentioned before, we don't do this wine with on purpose. Actually, we have to reserve because this is we bottled to pepper and then we have to reserve uh, wine to be aged further mm -hmm. otherwise we could just bottle to pepper right yeah. but but no we reserve some barrels so every year we accept allocations for all the for, for all the countries of the world and then it's always over uh, it's it's never is never uh, yeah. it's never enough yeah. And of course, you can't sell all of it because then you can, yeah, you don't have anything left to leave maturing to become yes. Del Duque. Exactly. But, yeah. you know, when we get to the Del Duque, then it's going to be a very, very small percentage. Yeah, yeah, yeah so of course. It makes, it makes that wine uh, more rare. Yeah. Right. Fun. So, guys, if, if you have anything, uh, anything to, uh, to, to add or if you have some tasting notes or something you feel, just put it in the chat. Uh, Glenn is asking, do you also finish a bottle of Vigna Abbe in one day? I can. I, I can. I can, yes. If, if we have to. You, you try me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's also a wine that I, I, I really enjoy. Uh, yes, yes. But I, but I think I'm faster with you, Pepper. It's, it's so much easier. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the Pepe is much closer to like how you would drink a white, a white wine. Uh, yes. And the, the amontillados and the other the other uh, sherries we're going to have are much more. Um, uh, how do you say? Yeah, uh, how to say it? Um, you sit you sit down with them more. I think the the, the Tio Pepe is yes. more of a, an everyday uh, part of, part of your life thing. I I think you know a, a term that the winemakers and the sommeliers use is it's a silent could be a silent wine. So this is a kind of wine that you could you know just sit down and. And, and drink alone, yeah, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, not not alone with with somebody, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I in understand. a more relaxed kind of moment. Yes, um, lifetime lifetime of an open bottle of Vignabe. Uh, same goes for it. Also, uh, I forgot to mention, but um, uh, Tio Pepe has fifteen percent. Vignabe or our Amontillado has sixteen point five. We didn't add any alcohol, uh, and I'm going to make the question uh, the, for you. Uh, so the question is how that you know that happened, and it's very simple. It's just simple concentration. So the wine uh, was aging for 12 years, and there is a natural evaporation, so about two three percent per year. Uh, so everything else concentrates. So water evaporates, H2O, very small molecule, and alcohol and sugar they they stay. They stay inside of the barrel. Okay. Now to the question: How may, how much time should we keep a bottle open? Uh, I mean, it's a wine. If once again, if if you have the bottle properly closed in the fridge, uh, you, you are perfectly fine for one month. It's okay. Yeah. You should not have them. You should you should just no, no. you know uh, empty the bottle quite fast because one of the things that I like always to say to bartenders: don't use just the wine in one cocktail. If you, if you order a Montiado, of course, for us, it would be great if you order the whole portfolio and you use the ever, everything. But I think in the sense of business, it's better to say, okay, 
I have a bottle of Amontillado and I have two cocktails for it. So, you, you know, you keep, you keep on rotating the bottle and yeah? not leaving the bottle for, I don't know, six months. And then when you go there, it's not already on the maximum potential. Uh, so I think it's better, you know, to have kind of a plan. And then why not being seasonal and changing the sherry according to that? I think that's very interesting, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, it, of course, it is not a spirit which will keep for much longer. So you have to take a, take into account this fact and, and then adjust uh, to that fact. Yeah. Yes. That's a good I tip mean, also, I think. Yeah. Yes, I think it's also the same. We are not the only ones. Also, vermouth, for example, is another example. How 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 much time can you keep a bottle of vermouth? I mean, vermouth they have more sugar inside and so on, but still you cannot keep it forever, right? If you want to have a perfect vermouth to serve in your Manhattan, for example, you need to take care that it's fresh. Yeah. All right. Uh, also, maybe we should add. So this uh, Amontillado serves slightly chilled. Or also yes. at what temperature? So here we're talking about a, a, a little bit higher. So, um, I mean, depends. Uh, there is kind of a threshold. So between 8 and 12 degrees, mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest with you, I prefer to have it more chilled than, than, than warmer. Yeah. Yeah, so eight, 8 degrees, I would say 8, 9 degrees would be, would be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So out of the fridge, into your glass, and don't leave it too long, and then that will be perfect. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, there is one more thing that I like actually to add. It's, it's my favorite pairing. Okay. So in, in, in Jerez, we do this uh, cold tomato soup called the gazpacho. Mm -hmm. And I learned this the first, uh, the first time that I was in Jerez. Uh, so we were in La Feria and everybody was putting a little bit in their soup. In the gazpacho, yeah, I heard that. In too. the gazpacho, yes. So they were making kind of a... Sherry Mary, so a Bloody Mary with, uh, with cherry. Yeah. <laughs> Something to try out. It's very, very nice. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we'll go on to the next uh, sherry to taste. Which yeah. one uh, will that be, Joao? That's going to be the Oloroso. The Alfonso Oloroso. Yes. I'll just put it on the screen. So in here, um, we, we need to mention that we also have 100% of Palomino, but there is a difference from the Tio Pepe and the Amontillado. And the difference is that in a Tio Pepe and Amontillado, we use the first press of this grape. So it's a very gentle press. It's the first juice of these grapes. So for the Alfonso, we're going to use a second press a harder press that will crush seeds and also the skin. So of course, what you're going to obtain is a more, it's a, it's a must with more body, with more nuttiness to offer. Okay. So although it's the same grape, it's going to have a totally different uh, personality in the end of the day. Okay. And of course, let's not forget, it is oxidating from the first day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you so can see that immediately when you put it in the glass, it's the color, yeah. have this way darker uh, amber color than the Amontillado, for example. You know, it was just for, um, half of his life under the east. So, of course, here is going to be uh, it's going to be totally different. It's going to be a lot of woods, dry fruits. A little bit of vanilla. There is a sweet sensation, right, mm -hmm. on the nose, different yeah. from the Amontillado. Yeah. Right. There is a, a very reasonable explanation for that, which is remember uh, that we talked about Tio Pepe and Amontillado that they are aging uh, under the floor. So here there was no yeast. The yeast did not consume the sugars and the mm -hmm. glycerin. So this wine. Ask is glycerin, so it's giving us this sweet perception on the nose. But this wine in the end actually wants to trick us. Because if you taste it, it's going to be dry anyway. Yep. But you're going to have kind of a dryness followed by a sweet sensation. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's a little bit more sugar in it, eh? as as you could see on the on the slide. It's about four grams per liter. It's it's not sweet at all, of course. It's uh, it's still dry. No, 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 no. Yeah. no. But no. but the sensation that we have, it's actually yeah. it's actually uh, a sensation of sweetness, right? So mm -hmm. it's a little bit more velvety on on the tongue. And uh, of course, this is it's a very aromatic wine. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called Oloroso, because yeah. Oloroso is coming. Uh, from the, the word oler, so to smell. The one that smells actually, a lot, yeah, oloroso. Yes, exactly. It's actually quite interesting because in the past, uh, the people used to put oloroso in, in one container with some holes and they would perfume their houses in Jerez. So okay. it's quite, uh, quite interesting, yes. <laughs> right, like a sort of febres uh, yes. thing, but yes. a bit more vol voluminous. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's, it's a beautiful wine, so full of nuttiness, vanilla is here, um, and you feel that there is a lot more extraction from the wood, mm -hmm. from the oak, right? right? So here we're talking about 18% uh, of alcohol, so that accelerates this extraction. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called actually alcoholysis, is the process of, of extracting components from the wood. Yeah. Uh, I know it's a very you know, technical uh, mm -hmm. term, I promise I don't say it anymore. <laughs> Alcoholics, uh, it's, it's a good word. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a sweet <laughs> word, yeah, exactly. Um, and and yeah, so it is just giving a lot of characteristics to this wine, this, this extra fortification, this extra contact with the wood. I think also for the people who are not that into sherry but do know their whiskies, Oloroso is, a, is the, the word they, they hear a lot for the, the a exactly. lot of the sherry casks used for whiskey aging are Oloroso casks. Exactly. So, uh, of course, um, a lot of uh, distiller, whiskey distillers, they, they love to use uh, sherry barrels. Mm -hmm. A lot of them, they are Oloroso. I mean, nowadays, it's not just whiskey distillers, but also uh, the rum industry yep. is using. Um, and I mean, so it's, it's, as, as I said before, sherry is also serving as, a, as, a, as an enhancer, as a, uh, a link um, uh, to, to, to other spirits, right? So this is the way that they have to do it. In these barrels, um, after so many years, some sherry is going to be impregnated in the wood and it will actually come back through alcoholysis through the whiskey. Yep. Okay, so there is no sherry inside of the barrels, but it is actually uh, coming uh, from, from the wood. Where it's, yep. you know, when you put a, a whiskey with 60% of alcohol, it will be extracted. Because, because the alcohol is even higher than the sherry was, it will extract it uh, from the wood again. Okay? Exactly. That's, that sounds logical, of course. Yeah. yeah. No, that's great. Maybe another uh, geeky question, uh, maybe just for me. Uh, is it uh, European wood that you use or American oak? Um, in the past, it used to be actually European yeah. uh, wood, uh, but now it's uh, American oak. It's mostly yes. American oak, yeah. Yes. yes. And it's not toasted, uh, like like the, the whiskey industry, the bourbon industry, they do it. Uh, there is there is a, actually a light light toast, but it's almost, almost certainly light. not charred. Like a... no, not not charred exactly. That's what I wanted to say. Yes. Okay, it's a really nice wine. Yes, I mean, of course, here uh, while you had, for example, fresh cheeses prepared with your pepe and amontillado, here you're gonna have perhaps a cube cheese, it's gonna be a, a, a better match. You can have a good steak. If you yep. love a good steak. Red meat. Uh, yeah. Yes, definitely. Uh, go for an Oloroso, it's, it's, a, it's a good match. It's gonna make, um, it's gonna prepare your, 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 your taste buds, you know, for that juicy meat that you're gonna face in, in front of you. Yeah. Maybe another question from Michiel. Is it full oxidative aging because you add more alcohol from the beginning? Or is it is always the same amount of alcohol you add to stop the fermentation? Um, so, in fact, we, we don't stop the fermentation. Uh, the fermentation, it's, it's stopping by itself. Then we have a wine with 11%, 13%. And then we do a fortification. Um, yep. So, in the case of Tio Pepe, we add it to 15%. And already for, um, for an Oloroso, we do it 17% or 18% in case of Gonzalez bias. Okay, yeah. this is what you need actually to, to 
stop the yeast or to prevent the yeast to form in, on the top of the wine. Yeah. So you do that on purpose. Now, there is one thing that we don't do on purpose, which is you can make an Amontillado in two years. So you have a fino sherry, it forms the yeast, and then you kill the yeast and it starts to oxidate. Yeah. Of course, that accelerates the process. I'm not saying that is right or wrong. It's just a way to do it. In Gonzalez Bias, we let it die. So it is what it is. Yeah. So we, we, we dance a little bit with, with the nature. So uh, if, if there is a, a thick layer after, you know, three years, we, we let it be. So we don't gonna, uh, we don't gonna put more alcohol in order to kill the yeast and, and make an amontillado. Yeah. yeah. I think um, cocktail wise then with this wine, um, it seems to me like this one is more difficult to, to use uh, because it has a lot of character. Or is that is that a misconception from my end? Oh, I'm not sure. I think it's just depending on, on the time of the year, for example. If you want to make a nice winter cocktail, um, I mean, there is so many possibilities. Of course, here you are adding nuttiness, dry fruits, um, a little bit of caramel and vanilla. Um, I mean, this is a, is a good example. Mm -hmm. Also, the thing is that, once again, it doesn't need to be the star of the cocktail. It can be just a tool. So here, there is an apricot infused Oloroso sherry. I mean, just the sound of that. So you have the apricot, and then, of course, you're going to work with the nuttiness, with the orange um, of, of the Oloroso, I think is a perfect match. Mm -hmm. So... It doesn't need to be the star, but it's just created another ingredient for the cocktail. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, here, I mean, uh, chocolate uh, as well. Um, so, yeah. you know, you can pair so many uh, ingredients of that season with mm -hmm. this Oloroso. I think it's more about season. Um, I mean, if you want to do a summer cocktail with Oloroso, I would say that's not easy. Yes, yeah. Yeah. that's true. Yeah. Yeah. But ch chocolate seems like a perfect fit because just nor just pairing chocolate with this wine would work too. So yes. why not use it in a cocktail? So uh, yes, I mean there is a lot of notes as well that are similar to whiskey as well. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, is whiskey good on in, on the summer? I don't think so. But mm -hmm. you know, in in the winter is gold. So I think it's it's more about season yeah. than anything else. So this was another uh, another inspiration, maybe the Amberico. Uh, yes, this was also from the Two Pepper One Hundred One from last year, and this one actually is from a German bar called uh, Jigger and Spoon in uh, in Stuttgart. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You already saw what the next uh, wine is that we'll be tasting. So uh, it's that will be the Christina. So I'll have a little pour of that myself. And the Christina says on its label medium. What does that mean? <laughs> Well, it's actually, I mean, there is a lot of styles of medium. Within mm -hmm. the medium, there is a lot of styles. So you can have between five grams of sugar till 40, or you can have from 40 to, to 80. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of things. Medium just means that you're making a blend, right? And you're using two types of grape. Uh, so you're using here... Uh, Oloroso, so Palomino Fino, and you're using Pedro Jimenez. So you're making a blend of these two wines, uh, and then you're going to make a medium. Now, uh, depending uh, which uh, winery you are, this going to, you know, you're going to have different levels of sugar, right? Yeah. I think that it's better to be on the side of less because then you can, you know, you have more possibilities if you want to do this uh, a wine to pair with fruit. Because, you know, if you have just higher sugar, then you just can make this wine a dessert wine, right? Yeah. But in fact, this wine can be used uh, also uh, in one of the, of the main dishes, okay? It has a little bit of sweetness, but it's not overwhelming, okay? Yeah, I see what you mean. So it has the sweetness, it has the sugar, but it's not sticky, it's not... Um overwhelming it's just it's just there a little bit exactly so here of course you have all the notes from the Oloroso, the wine that we just taste 
but then he has another element. He has these raisins, and this is coming from mm -hmm. the second wine, um, or, or the second grape varietal, the Pedro Jimenez. Right, he's going to give us these raisins, these figs as well, these dates, these sultanas. I think is is the easiest wine to understand for somebody that never tasted sherry. I think is the easiest wine to understand because, I mean. Especially, for example, I'm here in Germany. If I give it to you, Pepper, if this person is, you know, the first time that he has contact with Sherry, go, oh my God, it's so dry. You know, mm -hmm. you need to get used to this dryness. And you also need to have the right context as well for, for a tube pepper. But this one, it's so much easier to understand. It's a wine that I can give to my mother-in-law and she's going to say, oh my God, this is amazing, right? Because that's <laughs> what she's used to. Yeah. These wines a little bit more sugar uh, are just easier to understand. Yeah. But I just loved, love it as well. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. not a sweet pet of guy, but here it has the right sweetness. You know, it's, that's why it's called the medium, right? Mm -hmm. It's not too sweet. It's not too, uh, too dry. It is just perfect. So we should actually understand medium as like the midpoint between the dry wines we had and the, the more sweeter wines we will have. But within the range of Gonzalez Bias, this is for you yeah. medium, but a medium yes. for a different house will be completely different in sugar level. And exactly. It could be higher or it can be actually uh, lower. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. All right. I mean, here you also can understand the power of Pedro Jimenez, right? Because mm -hmm. just 13% of Pedro Jimenez is adding almost all the sugar, about 34 grams of sugar or 36 grams of sugar is coming actually from this 10% or 30% of the And also in the flavors, because I, I do know uh, Pedro Jimenez as a, as a wine, as a, as a grape, and it, it takes over a lot, even if it's just 13%. So uh... Exactly. It's very, very dominant. Mm -hmm. I mean, but here, a good pairing with... Um, um, with foie gras, for example, it could be could be really nice. All kinds of cheeses, I can imagine. All kind of cheeses, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Also, some stews, some meat dishes. I mean, it's also very versatile. I mean, it can also be enjoyed just just uh, silence, right? This solo solo mm -hmm. drinking, right? I think it's fine. Also chilled. I, I would I would say I think this wine at uh, 12, 12 degrees would be would be perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because then say, even yeah. yeah, because the sweetness will be even more subdued at that temperature, probably. Exactly. Yeah. I mean it's also it's also could be served as an imperative. For example, in in Jerez, we serve uh, Cristina as an imperative. If it's at the right temperature, it can be well perceived, although what? it has a little bit of sweetness. Why is it called Christina? Uh, it's a name of, uh, of, um, of a queen, yes, a Spanish queen. Spanish Actually, queen. Uh, also Alfonso is as well, he's a king. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gonzalez Baez has a very close relationship with the royal family. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so they, they named our, our best wines after some, some royal royal personalities yeah, yeah yeah right and and this one uh, is this also uh for winter cocktails or autumn cocktails or where would you use this yes winter uh autumn winters yes i would say i mean uh i, I would say that would be that would be the season yes because of the extra sweetness because of the nuttiness so it's flavors that you're gonna you know appreciate more when it's a bit colder mm -hmm. When it's cold outside, <laughs> I think there's a there's a good uh, a good example from uh, Matthias again. Uh, in the, yes, in the in the slides, talk us through this one because this has some funky ingredients too. Oh yes, yes. Here you use uh, actually one of our whiskies. It's also a sherry age whiskey, Nomad whiskey. Mm -hmm. I love the name, by the way. Yeah. Alegria, happiness. Yeah. Uh, well, very well done. And then you have this again, uh, you know, showing again that cherry can be a tool. 
infused cacao, cacao nib. Uh, so again, chocolate and pistina, good pairing. Uh, use uh, some Angu Jimenez bitters. And what is this Angu Jimenez? <laughs> yeah. Is Angustura with Pedro Jimenez. And this is something that every bartender should have in their bar. So you have, uh, it's very simple. It's just half, or maybe a little bit more than half of Angustura. You have to make actually your own blend of mm -hmm. Angustura and Pedro Jimenez. Yeah? And you have to twist it the way that you want. But it's just... Yeah. So, so you, you get the get combination of the spiciness and the sweetness from the from the Pedro Jimenez. Uh, exactly. You get bitter and sweetness, and you have these raisins as well uh, in there. This fix, this uh, you know, this fruitiness that also the Pedro Jimenez is offering. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's a new bitter, in fact. Yeah. I think we should do a partnership one day with Angostura. We, we did. We did. We did a masterclass with Angostura last week, actually. So. Uh, you should uh, you should you guys should talk about that because it's, yeah so we should, we should it has been, it has been talked about a lot already so <laughs> yes and then uh, once again I mean he's infusing here um, yeah. a brandy uh, that is also belonging to us uh, which is the soberano mm -hmm. okay but uh, the infusion is actually also interesting because the lapsang sushong is the the smoky tea so I uh, really exactly. love the idea of the smokiness with the cacao with the sweetness with all, all the things he's doing. So. No, the cocktail is, is just very well uh, conceived. It's, mm. it's really, really interesting. But once again, would you drink that in the summer? This is an autumn uh, cocktail. Mm. It's, it's a winter cocktail. Yeah, well, if, you, if, if you force me, Joao, I'll drink it in the summer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, I see, I see. I will, I will not have to make a lot of efforts. I will no, listen. no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean... So if you don't believe in the season, maybe it could be the, the moment of, of, of the evening, yeah. right? So, for example, if you have an after dinner, uh, then you can go for a cocktail with Christina, for example, or a cocktail yeah. with Oloroso. I think so, too. Because of the sweetness, you, you wouldn't want it as an aperitif or before the meal. It's more of an after dinner. or uh, Yes. I can, I can see that. Yeah. I guess we're ready. Be ready to taste yes. happiness and diabetes in the same bottle. Happiness and diabetes in the same bottle. So that, <laughs> that would have to be the nectar. Exactly. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, did we taste solera? No, we didn't taste the solera. So we'll have no, we'll start I'm with sorry. solera. Let's wait sorry, with the sorry. diabetes a little bit and start the solera first. Okay, okay. So let's go for the solera first. The solera 1847. Why yes. 1847? Let's start with that, maybe. It's uh, the year where the first uh, son of Manuel Maria Gonzalez, the founder of Gonzalez Baez, was born. So he okay. named uh, this, this wine or this Solera 1847. Yeah. Yes. And it also says on the label, this is a, a cream sherry. This is a cream sherry. So a cream sherry uh, means more... Um, more sugar content. It has related to the to the sugar content. Okay, um, I mean sometimes there is because some some wineries they 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 do a, a medium that is quite higher, so it's a very thin line. But here we're already talking about 160, 170 grams of sugar per liter. I'm not uh, yeah no actually sorry 130 uh, grams of sugar per liter. So yeah. it's uh, almost uh, three times two times more than, than a medium. Okay? Yep. So here we have 75% of, of Oloroso, 25% of Pedro Jimenez. Uh, of course, it's aging just oxidative uh, aging because it's coming from Oloroso and also the Pedro Jimenez is following the same process. Mm -hmm. And of course, here you're going to already see the color of it is it's just this mahogany uh, mm -hmm. color. Uh, and this is mainly because, you know, the higher concentration of Pedro Jimenez. That's it, right? This is the beautiful old furniture. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, these this notes of uh, of raisins are more intense. I mean, it's just it's just uh, obvious, right? With mm -hmm. more Pedro Jimenez, which is a kind of a raisins wine. Then you have this vanilla, this wood, mm -hmm. all these sweet notes. You know this. Uh, uh, caramel, vanilla. And of no, course, actually, 
Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. We're getting already to the end of the meal, right? We, yeah. We're talking about uh, a dessert wine. Uh, so, of course, you can go for a, for a, for a cheese. In Jerez, this actually serves as an aperitif. Yeah, mm -hmm. so with, uh, with ice, uh, for example, uh, and paired with cheeses. And, but I see it more uh, as a dessert, dessert wine. So, for example, here it says uh, apple pie, so apple sugar, mm -hmm. for example, would be a good pairing. Yep. But I have an absolute favorite pairing. Uh, and I must say that my girlfriend is vegan, so I always have to you know, work around this when I want to make a sherry dinner. Yep. Uh, and she loves coconut, vegan coconut ice cream. And so if you just put, you know, a little bit of Solera on the top of this coconut ice cream, it's just an absolute, uh, yep. yes, this is really, really great. I can see how that works with the vanilla notes in the, in the, in the sherry. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, I mean, you, in Spain, they also do it with um, vanilla ice cream. Yeah. Right. So it's very popular as well, but it works very, very well. Not only in Spain, I, I do that too, but I usually do that with uh, Pedro Jimenez. So, uh, yeah. Yes, as well. So, but if I understand correctly, so uh, this wine and the, 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 the Oloroso and also the, um, the Cristina, they are all eight years aged. Yeah. Uh, yes. So this is going to be, um, this is coming from the Oloroso Soleras, right? So this is eight years. And also the Pedro Jimenez, it's it's about eight to nine years. Also the pigs. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's the average. Yeah. Oh, we're getting some reactions now. So oh, I screams like for um, creamy blue cheese. I can uh, I can imagine. Yeah, that sounds good. Yes. Jan just wants bigger samples. Uh, I can understand that too. Uh, yes, I, I think that we we're talking about even soaked the cheese for some time. Yeah, definitely. Yes. I mean the. Um, uh, Actually, you can you can make a nice a nice infusion in the, in the cheese with that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, yes, that's true. That's true. Yeah. I mean, and also, yeah. Michiel says we have more autumn and winter than summer here in Belgium, so we need more autumn and winter cocktails. <laughs> pretty good, pretty good, uh, um, pretty good uh, uh, observation there. Yeah, I, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> uh, well, we can't. We help can it. send the wines. It's okay. Yeah. Um, yes, but here I think it, it asks for more funkier kind of cheeses, right? Mm -hmm. Then rather than the fresh ones that we would go for, or the cured ones uh, that we would go for the Oloroso, right? Yeah. 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 But of course, also for cocktails, this is uh, this is a wine that pairs very well. Um, in the, the Two Pepper One Hundred One, we had uh, the third challenge was to make a, a riff. On a, on a fino colada, which is a cocktail from Dean Kellen uh, and Matthias, also did a great job by creating a solera colada. So mm -hmm. instead of using fino, use the cream sherry. Uh, instead of using coconut cream, he came up with this coconut rum agricole that was working very well, mm -hmm. not adding no the, the the sweet fat notes of the coconut cream. Then you use some red aper aperitif, a little bit of lime juice, um, and a homemade tapache, which, which is actually quite easy to make. It's basically a pineapple syrup, with, with also with the peel and everything that you just leave and to ferment for a couple okay. of days. So it's fermented pineapple syrup, basically. Yes, kind of, yes. Sounds so good. it's kind of a funky pineapple syrup, yes, let's say. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it yeah, it, it, it's just um, has a little bit of um, uh, CO2 and as well, it gets a little bit of alcohol, not too much because it's just a few days of fermentation, uh, but actually it's quite, quite nice to use uh, in a cocktail like this. And again here, you, he has the pairing of the Solera with that coconut uh, that you were talking about on the ice cream. Exactly, so. yeah. So you have the coconut and, and, and the raisins working together and... I like it so much that um, when I go around, uh, I take this cocktail with me. So, you know, instead of making my own cocktail with Sumera, my own interpretation, I love this cocktail so much that I take it with me. Of course, I always say that it's by Matthias Soberon, yeah. but it's a cocktail that is it's, um, 
how do you say it's a crowd pleaser everybody yeah. likes it yeah i can imagine yeah so i think it's a, it's a good take on, on a pina colada which are normally you know they are great but they are just you know another kind of cocktail you know like fat and, and sweeter and here you you, you have uh, a different kind of uh, experience mm -hmm. Yeah, that's some good inspiration from, uh, from yes. Matthias. And lower ABV as well. So here you don't have, you know, the full uh, parts of, of rum, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you have just 20 ml, uh, so half shot, and then you have a bit more of the cream, but we're talking about a wine with 18% uh, uh, of alcohol. Yeah, yeah. So uh, on the total, that will uh, bring down the, the, the average uh, alcohol level in the, in the cocktail. Uh, exactly. Yeah, relatively. I mean, right. just on itself, this, this could be a wine just also enjoyed uh, simple. But I think mm -hmm. that there's so many possibilities in cocktails. I mean, adding a little bit of sweetness uh, instead of using, you know, we didn't have to use any sugar or mm -hmm. Matthias didn't have to use any sugar to find a solution to add sweetness to his cocktail. So once again, it's uh, a cocktail tool as well. A different one, but, but one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, talking about sweetness, I think we should uh, then go on to our uh, announced diabetes mix. Uh, <laughs> so the, the Pedro Jimenez, uh, the Nectar, which is a brilliant wine. I, I've had it before in a couple of master classes, but um, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'd love to hear your take on it, uh, Joao. Well, this is, uh, I mean, 100% Pedro Jimenez. And I mean, actually, I have a slide explaining. Uh, um, what we do different to these grapes yeah. that allow us to to do uh, this wine. Okay? I'll just put it on screen there for you. Yeah. Because this is the one. There we go. So this wine is different because, you know, the Palomino, we just, we harvest the grapes and directly and very quickly we send it to the to the winery that we can you know start to press and, and, and ferment as soon as possible. But with Pedro Jimenez and Muscatel, uh, which is uh, Muscatel, we don't use in Gonzalez Bias, but the process are the same. Uh, so what we do is after we harvest, there is an extra maturation of these grapes, and we just do it using you know the natural resources that we have, which is the sun. Uh, so we let these grapes sun dry to for about 14, uh, 14 days, depending on the conditions that, that year. And to this process, we call it soleo. It's also a word that is coming from the sun. Mm -hmm. So basically what's gonna happen is that the water will, is gonna evaporate and just concentrating all the sugars, the natural sugars of the grapes. So yeah, in the end, you're gonna be left with a, with a raisin to work with. That's gonna be your raw material to produce this wine. To press, uh, in here you're gonna of course to use a, a very strong press, mm -hmm. uh, similar to the ones that you use uh, for olive oil. Okay, I don't know if you saw one, so it's a really really hard one because you need more power to, you know, to extract this. Well, you cannot say that it's a juice; it's actually already a syrup. Mm -hmm. Okay. Once this is done, um, you have these musts, and then you just have to click a few times forward. Yes, so we're going to fer ferment it, of course, but we're going to have to stop fermentation midway because otherwise more sugars will be um, will be consumed, right? Yeah, you get more and more alcohol and it wouldn't be uh, exactly. palatable anymore. Yeah. Okay. yeah, exactly. So, and actually we want to keep that sugar because that's what mm -hmm. makes this wine uh, special, right? Yeah. So you just have to go a little bit forward. Mm -hmm. Yes, so then it goes through the process uh, of oxidative aging. So, I mean, with so much sugar as well, it's just too much food for the yeast. It doesn't form at all. Mm -hmm. um, and this is going to give origin to, of course, Muscatel and Petro I mean, I said that we don't work with Muscatel, but it's only at the moment. We have Muscatel wines that have more than, than 100 years old. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and sometimes actually we are lucky enough to taste some of these, these wines. I mean, you taste it in a small vessel, you know, with a pipette, but still you are tasting this wine. These are, because, a, sorry? 
No, yeah, I, w- I was going to say because these have more sugar, they they are better suited for very long aging. Uh, definitely, yes. definitely. I mean, after hundred years, uh, of course, what you're going to get it's a it's kind of a bitter symphony. Sometimes even a bit acid because it's yep. becoming kind of vinegary. But of course, it's a great experience. Yep. So, I mean, right now we don't do muscatel, but uh, maybe in the future we're going to do some. Yep. Yeah. Um, Yes, so we get to our nectar. And here we have 100% with the as I said, is aging in average for nine years. And we have an astonishing 380 grams of sugar per liter. That's why I said this is giving you, of course, a lot of happy feelings. But also, if you have too much of it, uh, it will not be good you know, for your I'll, sugar level. I'll just repeat those those jumps in sugar level we made. So the Alfonso was uh, still four grams per liter. Then we go to the Cristina, which was forty grams. I think uh, the oh no, the, the Cristina. No, no, it was the the Amontillado was four grams. The Oloroso was forty grams. Then we went to one one twenty eight, then one eighty for the Solera eight uh, eighteen forty seven, and now three hundred and eighty. So it's uh, yeah, quite it's high big. jumps in a sugar level. Exactly. I mean, our winemaker, he likes to say that this is a dessert on itself. Yeah, I mean, you need anything else. Of course, as you mentioned, Jerome, with, uh, with the vanilla ice cream or even with the coconut, vegan coconut ice cream I was telling, um, this is just a great match. I mean, here, it is full on. This is a raisins wine, yeah? So raisins, this fix, this kind of chocolate, dark tobacco, mm-hmm. it's very present. I absolutely love Pedro Jimenez wine. Yes, it's, I mean, it's just a great experience from, from the nose to the taste and the aftertaste is, it's really, really persistent, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you can't put this one in the, uh, as the first wine in the tasting. No, no, no. <laughs> Later on, you're going to, you know, wet your lips and you're going to still feel a little bit of Pedro Jimenez. Yes, oh. it's very, very, very interesting wine. I mean, of course, yeah, in cocktails, I, I don't know if I put a cocktail uh, in the end. I don't think so. Uh, no. But I think the reason why is because this is the perfect solution for adding sweetness to your cocktail without yeah. adding sugar. And here you're talking about your old fashions, for example. Even uh, your Negronis, for example, if you don't want to use, uh, you know, um, sweeter vermouth, you can actually pair it and 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 have you know the sweetest but without adding sugar i think that's mm-hmm. that's great in any cocktail you know a little bit of this wine uh and you're gonna you know put combine all the ingredients together adding the sweetness adding the you know uh, a little bit of fruitiness as well yeah 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 Well, I can keep drinking this and just be silent. <laughs> <laughs> it is, as, as I said before, it's a silent wine, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's a wine that you can just enjoy by itself. That's correct. Yes. I mean, of course, here I was uh, hearing someone with a blue cheese. Of course, the blue cheese is this great pairing. Uh, or perhaps a, a, a chocolate uh, lava cake, for example. Mm-hmm. What yeah, kind of desserts? I think this would work very well. Yeah, it needs some strong flavors to stand up to this. Uh, yes, uh, definitely. Absolutely. Liquid candy. <laughs> candy, tiramisu. A good time is so, yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, this is great stuff. And, and as you said, very, very versatile. Uh, also, we talked about the Anko Jimenez uh, that you can make for yourself to, uh, to give a little... Um, little kick to your bitters uh, or a different interpretation of your bitters. So yeah. a very cool ingredient to work with. Uh, yes. I think that all in all, I mean, we talked about, first of all, we talk about the diversity of, of these wines. So we tasted six wines and we're still talking about sherry. Then the versatility, we saw the wine being used in, with food, being used in cocktails uh, or drinking solo. Uh, and this was the case for every single wine. You, you have so many uses for the same wine. Mm-hmm. So versatile, diverse, 
um, and financial sustainable. I like to say that a lot because okay. these wines, although they are aging for so many years, uh, look at you, Pepe, four and a half years. Look at um, uh, Christina for eight, nine years. So our wines that need time to be produced, but still the price is it's so fair, right? So what you get and the price that you pay, it's, it's quite fair. So I think for the bars, it's also important, you know, to, I mean, I know that we all like to use these expensive bourbons in, in, in our bars to make our old fashions. Uh, but I think that we also have to have tools like, like, like this and, and others to, you know, to, to fulfill our portfolio of spirits. So Absolutely. it's going to be also sustainable for your bar. And of course, low ABV, you know, following this trend, uh, it's also an interesting um, ingredient to use if you want to reduce the alcohol uh, in your cocktails. Yeah, in instead of spirits, of course, because you have only the 15 to 18 uh, percent. Exactly. Yes. I mean, uh, a combination of, of spirits it would be the best. And as we saw as well, I mean, this has to do with the versatility, but, you know, although it also goes very well with darker uh, spirits, uh, but then you have also the Finos and Amontillados that go very well with. Uh, uh, Clearer, cl clearer uh, yeah, spirits like, like gin and yeah. gin and uh, tequila, yeah, and like the first, the first, the first highball cocktail from Matthias we saw. Uh, exactly, so it was a good example of that. Yes. Uh, Glenn is asking, do we need to know anything about Palo Cortado for the competition? Because of course, these are not the only wines uh, you have uh, at Gonzalo's Bias. Okay, so, yes. Um, well, this depends um, if if you're going to use it for the blind tasting because. Palo Cortado is, um, I'm going to tell you already, if we have Palo Cortado and Oloroso in, in the tasting, the blind tasting, it's a challenge because in terms of color, they are very similar. They are both oxidative uh, and you need to taste them you know, beforehand uh, to know the difference. And the differences are subtle, but they are there. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I should tell you what is mainly the difference, yeah, maybe uh, maybe go through it quickly uh, because. Uh... Yeah. So basically, you have you know on the rose you have more sweeter uh, sensations and you have a little, it's a bit more powerful, more crafty, mm -hmm. um, because it's made of the second press of the grapes, right? The Palomino Fino, the Palo Cortado, although it's an oxidative aging, but it's made with the first press, so it's more elegant. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it's closer to the Palomino Fino. Probably in a way, in yes, a way, yeah. but without the yeast. Without so the yeast. that's why it's complicated. You know, you really need to have them both together, then taste, and then you're going to feel the difference. Yeah. Yes. So when I did the challenge in 2017, this was the the hardest uh, for for all of us. Yes, yeah. definitely. So if you're planning on joining the competition, taste your Palo Cortados next to your Oloroso to, exactly. to know what you uh, what you what you can expect. Yes. I'll uh, just, uh, if there's any more questions, just put them in the chat now, but I'll go to the couple uh, couple last slides here uh, before we go to that. So uh, that hashtag we should use uh, probably, Joao, if we're posting <laughs> on Instagram. <laughs> in the end of the day, I just hope that, uh, you know, one of you, uh, well, unfortunately not all of you, but one of you are gonna have the same experience that I had in 2017. And uh, yeah, that you're going to be able, you know, that the Belgium candidate is going to be able to do the same as I did, which is to sign a barrel in the bodega. And that mm -hmm. would be, you know, uh, the best, uh, like I said, the best feeling for me, you know, is to, to host you there and, uh, you know, to be on your side while you're signing this barrel. That would be the best. Yeah. Uh, how, cool, how cool would it be to tell people that you signed the barrel in the bodega of Gonzalez Bias. The, the thing is, you know, of course, I'm the least known person in, <laughs> in this bodega, but I love F1 and it is not very far away from my Ayrton Senna barrel. Ah, okay. Yeah, so it's it's actually pretty cool. Yeah, if you have yeah. the opportunity of that, I think that's the best price. Uh, you're, you're, you know. you're actually a close friend of Ayrton Senna. That's basically... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one question from Michiel. You also make uh, vermouths, good, good mm -hmm. nice vermouths, uh, like uh, a copa. Which sherries do you use uh, in these vermouths? Yes. So, 
for the for the seco and for the blanco we use pino mm -hmm. uh, now if the question is coming why is that sweet is because we add a little bit of, of unfermented must uh, to the wine in order to you know to give the sweetness so we don't add sugar but we have concentrated must that we can add you know and it's from made from the same grapes so it doesn't alter the the, the vermouth in a strange way let's say okay uh, the extra seco actually it's it's quite high in in, in sugar compared to the other extra secos it's in the limit uh, it's about 1 grams of sugar per liter, something like this. So it's really on the limit. Uh, the Blanco has a little bit more. And the red is based on Solera, mm -hmm. Solera cream. So Oloroso and Pedro Jimenez. Yes. And I mean, those shape, those vermouths are not, actually not, you know, uh, created recently. They are already from, um, from beginning of last century. So this is a recipe that we recovered from our archives. And we try to do it as, as close as possible. For it. Mm. Really nice products too. Uh, yes, to use lovely. In cocktails as a drink, uh, drink as they are actually. So, uh, I mean, it's also a good way to, to use sherry uh, in, in a cocktail because they are sherry vermouths. Yeah? Yeah. yeah, that's true. I also like them a lot. All right, Joao, we uh, set out to make this about an hour and a half for the tasting. And I think we almost managed it. So uh, we, we did well, I think. Um, Pat ourselves on the back there. Um, I don't know if there's any any more questions, but uh, otherwise we're going to the to the to the final stages of this tasting. Um, as we said, uh, all the practical info for the competition you'll have that in your mailboxes uh, tomorrow probably, uh, if you need that. Uh, and you can also also uh, always get in touch with Sinoco about uh, all those things. Um, so yeah, we hope uh, to have uh, inspired a couple of you to uh, to join. To, uh, to be there uh, signing a barrel uh, in, a, in a couple months uh, with Joao. Uh, and of course, for the, in the first stage to, uh, to be in our finals uh, uh, on the 11th of April uh, in Nivelle, which would be nice. Any last words, uh, Joao, that you want to uh, add to our guests? Well, of course, thank you very much, you know, for taking the time and uh, for listening to this Sherry talk. It's always a pleasure um, it's something that I really like to talk about uh, and it's something that is I'm always learning so now I have also homework thank you Jerome I need to know yes. if Amontillado means more than, than yeah. just uh, the name of the wine I I'm going to be hassling sure. you I'm going to be hassling you about it until I know <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe you can you can do the question yourself to, to, to do to Antonio you know next time in Jerez uh, but yeah so for me it was an absolute pleasure to be with you and to share what I know from, from the wines of Jerez. And I hope that I see you, of course, soon already in a national final. Uh, and of course, uh, in Jerez, if it's possible. Yeah, very cool. Very okay, much. from my part as well, thank you, Joao, for uh, making this a, a fun evening. Uh, thanks to Sinoco for organizing all of this uh, and making this possible. Um, and I'll just uh, quote uh, what a little quote I found about Sherry, that, which I actually like from Alexander Fleming, the, the uh, inventor of penicillin, who once uh, said, if penicillin can cure those that are ill, Spanish sherry can bring the dead back to life. <laughs> isn't, that an, isn't that a nice one to, uh, to close this tasting on? <laughs> Thank you all and Thank see you. you next time, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.